Good morning. We're definitely going to get a big bell for the next <laughs> session um, because it's now, as you may notice, it's 9.31. Mm. Um, good morning, everyone, and welcome to day two of the opening weekend of the Citizens' Assembly's consideration of the Eighth Amendment of the Constitution. We had an excellent day's discussion yesterday, and we heard from a broad range of speakers who gave us a very clear sense how Article 40, Section 3, Subsection 3, and the other associated legislative provisions operate in practice. Now, this morning we're taking a slightly different tack. Um, we will hear from Dr. Mark Sheehan from Oxford University about ethics. Dr. Sheehan is the Oxford Biomedical Research Centre Ethics Fellow and Director of the Oxford BRC Ethics Group within the Ethox Centre in the Nuffield Department of Population Health in the University of Oxford. Uh, Dr. Sheehan has been asked to talk to you about what ethics is, why it is relevant in this debate, and to provide a brief introduction to some um, ethics terminology and philosophy. Um, the information to be provided by Mark will hopefully allow members to develop a way of thinking about complex issues which have, a distinct, have, which have distinct moral implications. Um, essentially, it is hoped that introducing this topic at an early stage will show us that it is possible to have a broad range of diverse views on this topic and that there is no right or wrong answer. Um, but um, I'm not an expert on ethics, so I think I should stop at this stage. And I would now like to call on Dr. Sheehan to, ad to address the Assembly. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Justice Lefoy. Um, it's, it's an honour to be here. I'm, I'm, I'm very glad uh, to be able to hopefully help you um, in thinking about the challenging questions you have in front of you. Um, as Justice Afori said, I've got, um, I want to say a few things about um, a sort of structure or a framework for how we might approach ethical decisions in general. Um, we just, uh, here we go. <clears throat> so I want to give you, it's a, a bit of an introduction to, to ethics and ethical reasoning. Um, and a provider something like a structure for thinking about the sorts of problems that you're going to deal with. Um, both, both the particular cases, so the particular cases of the ethics surrounding abortion, um, but also, and I want to say a bit more about this, about the law, how you might go about thinking about the ethics of coming up with laws about abortion. Um, I'm not going to talk about either of those two things specifically, but in a sense they quite general. I'm also not going to talk about answers. I'm not here and to a lesser extent generally, I'm not particularly interested in the answers to, what, to these questions, to what's right or wrong. I don't particularly have a strong view either way. Um, but I want to think about how we reason about right and wrong and how we reason about getting to the right sorts of decision. Um, I think perhaps the most important thing that I want to get across here is just how ordinary the sorts of things that we're thinking about when we're thinking about ethics are. So it's the sort of thing that we always do, that we do routinely, daily, more times, I think, than we think. And so what, but what we don't do is we tend not to slow it down and think about it. A lot of the stuff happens very quickly and automatically almost. It's only when we get to a big question, a big question like the one that you, you're confronted with, that we start to try to, make, try to have to make sense of the way in which we think about it. So what I want to do is sort of start to unpack some of the ways in which we think about things by slowing it down and laying it out. <clears throat> so the first kind of question, and I want to consider a number of different questions, but the first kind of question is this question of what should I do? So imagine a case, perhaps better to say, what should we do? But by we here I mean us as individuals. I'm thinking of a situation where I'm confronted with a particular kind of case, or one of us, can, how do we go about figuring out what we should do? Well, so here are some of the things that we might consider. We might consider what our options are. We might consider who's involved, who are the people that are around us that are affected by the decision. Um, we normally have a sort of general sense of the things that matter to us, but that might be a sort of unrefined 
kind of sense. We might general kinds of principles that we think we subscribe to, but we don't always know quite how to apply them or how they get applied in particular cases. And when we've considered all of these things, then we weigh up or we judge, and that's an important distinction. Sometimes we, we sort of think, well, on the one hand, on the other hand, and we sort of do this balancing procedure, and other times we just say, no, this is what I've got to do. It's very clear and everything else just gets sort of put aside. So sometimes we might consider the consequences of the various options um, and other kinds of things we might think just about what matters and what's important. And then we make a decision. We make a decision about what we ought to do, about what's best. So here's an example. And I've, as you can tell, I've just made this up. It's not real. <laughs> But it's the kind of thing that might ordinary, ordinarily happen. So I've agreed to meet a friend for coffee after work, but as I leave the office, a junior co-worker stops to ask my advice about a task that she's finding difficult and needs to finish that night before she can leave. I don't have time to get in touch with my friend, and in any case, I cancelled the previous coffee meeting and was very late to the one before that. If you know me, you know that's absolutely true. Um, my co-worker's worried about completing this task and depends on me for advice on things like this, and stopping to provide proper help will make me late. So this is, exa so this is just, I, I take it this is the sort of thing that happens to everybody all the time, and it's the kind of thing, the kind of tension that we'd be familiar with. And I want to use this as a kind of key example here to think through the way in which we, we make these decisions. So the question is, what should I do in this situation? Two points to make reflections generally on the way in which I might go about answering this question. One is, I want to get it right. right. This seems to be an important kind of situation. It seems to be something that really requires something of me that I want to get right. And that, in and of itself, makes a difference to how we see the situation. If it wasn't something that I wanted to get right, then I wouldn't, the situation would present itself in a different way. So it's important in this case that I take, I, am, I already take the situation seriously and that matters for my approach to the question. So then there's this question of how do I go about deciding. Some of the things that I mentioned in the previous slide, um, alternatives, courses of action, what promises have I made, what commitments do I have, what expectations are there and what relationships am I involved in, all of which impinge on me in this particular situation. And what I might do, we might think, reflecting on my problem now, is that a good way to handle this is to do it piece by piece. To take each bit and sort of dissect each bit and reflect on each bit. And then when we've got a picture of all of the different commitments and relationships and elements of the puzzle, then to step back and then to make an overall judgement. To make an overall decision, to see the whole picture again. So now I want to think about a slightly different question. We're going to come back to that same example. This is a question, not what should I do, but what should he or she do? So the idea here is that quite often we judge people. We look at what other people are doing and we make an assessment or we, we judge them in particular kinds of ways. And what we're doing in those kinds of cases is, think, is, is thinking about what they should have done, what they should have done, what they did do, what they should do, and we're making an assessment of the actions of another person. So it's not me, it's the other person. So there are similarities here to, the, to when it's me. So when we th think about what other people say, we might think about what are the options that the other person has, what courses of action can they take, what sorts of commitments does that person have. All of the same things that we just talked about, we think about in the case of the second person when we're seeing another person, but we we're judging another person. But a key difference here is that we can't get inside the head of the other person, the other person who's acting, in the way that we know, in, or we, we often know inside our own head. So we understand our values, we understand our commitments, but we can't necessarily get such a good access to what other people are thinking. The way in which other people see situations. So this matters. So if you think about my example, about how I handle my coffee arrangements, think about the different perspectives of the people involved in that. So my friend, who's waiting patiently at the coffee shop, assuming, um, he's going to have a particular view of the situation. 
He's going to see me, he's going to see my situation, he's going to understand my work commitments, etc. in one particular way, and he's going to make a judgment of my action. My friend's friend is going to make a similar kind of judgment. My friend's friend who is watching all this take place, say, or hearing about it later, will have a view about me and have a view about my attitude to my friend, the way in which I've behaved with respect to my friend. So my friend's friend will have a perspective on the situation that will perhaps bias or perhaps be influenced by my friend's perspective. Similarly, another one of my co-workers might also have a different perspective on the situation. They might understand the relationships between myself and my junior co-worker in a particular way and understand the way in which the group works, the team functions and its importance. And my, my behaviour is important. So what we can see, I think, when we think about this, this second kind of question, the what should he or she do, is that we quickly see different perspectives and how people would come up with different answers to the question of what should I do? And they might make a bit different judgments. But in each of those cases, their perspective is going to be different and informed by a different account of what's going on in the situation. So my friend's friend might make a different judgment because they read the situation differently to the, the account that my co-worker will, the, 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 the judgment my co-worker will make. So two key points about this, what I'm going to call the second person judgment, when I'm judging the behaviour of somebody else. One is this point about uncertainty. When I'm judging what anybody else does, I'm in a different position with respect to what I know about their view of the situation and how I understand their reasons and their, their, their own justification for behaviour. So we have this uncertainty problem. But you'll notice what happened when we think about the coffee example, the, the different perspectives, is that it might be helpful. Actually, it might help to protect against that uncertainty if we imagine what others would say. We imagine the way in which other, was, others would respond to my particular behaviour. To things, that I've, to things that I've done. So what that does is give us perspectives. It gives us a different way of reasoning about a situation so we can check against it. A third kind of question. So I've looked at what should I do and a judgment, an assessment question of what should somebody else do. There's also a category of things as what should the law be or what should the policy be. And again, it's a, say, it's, a, it's a should question, it's a say it's an ethics question still. But it's a different kind of ethics question. It's a question that involves a different set of considerations. Thinking about a law or a policy that governs a whole society, a whole group of people. So we're thinking about a population level question rather than a particular act question. So if you think about the context of that judgment, it's, not a, it's a whole series of different behaviours, of different actions of individuals in that context. So it's not a specific case. It affects in different ways lots and lots of people. We need to ask a question here about what the role of the law is. What do we think the role of the law should be in this case? What's the role of the policy? What's it there for? One answer we might give here is that it's expressive. So somehow, if we have a particular law or a particular policy, it says something about what we care about. It says something about the kinds of things that matter to a society. We might also think, well, it's preventative, right? So one of the things you might think about law is it just stops certain things. So lots of different interpretations for what the role of the law or the policy might be, and that's going to be an important question important issue in deciding what the policy or what the law should be, namely what it's for. And then there's going to be questions of exceptions. How do we deal with exceptions? Of course, what counts as an exception is going to be defined in part by what the law is. Do the reasons that we give for enacting a particular law or policy, do they make a difference to who gets counts as it? Do we capture, capture everybody in every situation? So just a brief example here. I mean, imagine, this is one, one of the ones I think is quite, quite interesting to think about in this context. How do we handle a case when the patient and the family is in, the patient particularly is in extreme suffering and is about to die and the, the family recognises this and the patient recognises this and they ask the doctor to help, to put an end to it. Now, 
The reason this is an interesting question, obviously it's pretty controversial, but the reason it's, I take it to be an interesting question here is we can, I, I can imagine a case where the patient's suffering and the imminent end of their, and their, their life is so imminent that we can think the right thing to do here for the clinician may well be to end the patient's life or to help in ending the patient's life. So we might think that's the right thing to do in a particular case, but we might think that that doesn't follow that the law should be like that. Because when we're thinking about the law, we're thinking about these different considerations. We're thinking about populations and society and what it means. So it might be in certain kinds of cases the law pulls apart from the ethics. The ethics of specific cases. It doesn't make the law, it doesn't make the ethics, it doesn't take the ethics away from the question of what should the law be, it just takes it away from the specific kind of case. So a couple of final points about this distinction. So the law, as I've just suggested, the law and individual ethics systems can pull in different ways. And this might be about, I think it largely is about, their different functions. That question of what the role of the law is as opposed to the judgement that we make in a particular case. But there's definitely, law, there's definitely ethical issues involved in lawmaking. But they just operate at that different level that makes them... I think the, the onus on the lawmaker is much, more, is much, much heavier in the sense of it involves more people. It might not be more heavier in an ethical sense. Okay, I'd like to go, just go back to this question of reasons and reason giving. <clears throat> and just to say a little bit about, go back to the sort of ordinary kind of case. How we go about reasoning. So if I go back to my case, the coffee case, as I suggested, what we might do is think about each of the different reasons, each of the different options of what would happen, and I'm thinking about, about handling my junior co-worker, what would I say to her that would allow, perhaps allow me to compromise, allow me to go and get, meet my friend for coffee, but also to help? How would I, what do I say to her when I say I can't stay? Can we deal with it tomorrow? You'll be okay, don't worry. That sort of thing. Or what am I going to say to my friend when I just don't turn up? I'm sorry, you know, I know I haven't been a very good friend, I'm going to take you out for dinner, those sorts of things. Maybe that'll work, maybe it won't. But they're the sorts of things I might go through this list of what happens in each of the cases, how would I handle each? And I consider each reason, each set of considerations on its merits. And when I do that, I'm looking for what the best reason is, what the strongest reason is, or what the right reason is. And I'm trying out justifications to see how they go. So here's something that I might say. <clears throat> so on the one hand, I did promise my friend, and I haven't treated him very well of late, He's likely to be at the cafe on time. He's a punctual kind of person. And I value our friendship very highly. It's a long-standing one, and it's been an important part of my life. On the other hand, and here I'm switched to a different kind of reason, my co-worker is quite stressed and does feel under pressure. She's an important member of the team and relies on my advice to, get, to help get her over these little bumps. Her dependence on my help is perhaps not ideal, but it's part of my role, and I can make a difference here. So what I've, done, what I've done there is I've divided up the reasons and I've started to articulate different things that are, math, that, that are important here. So I've got a promise, um, and in the past I haven't treated my friend very well, and I have a f some feature of the person, of my friend, who's punctual. And I do care about the friendship, it's something that matters to me. So there's examples of the various different things I was talking about before. <clears throat> and then on the other hand, and these are the ones that are in green, my co-worker is under stress, is feeling pressured, and there's a certain sort of reliance. I have a certain relationship with her, a reliance to, for this sort of advice. And it's part of my role and my understanding of what I'm there to do. So I'm starting to pull out some of the things that matter in thinking about this case. So I decide I should stay and help my co-worker. Oh, that's my decision. Well, unless you, until you change my mind, of course. I think this is because I think I owe her the support and the encouragement that she needs here and now. There's something about the immediacy of it. Her position's uncertain, she feels vulnerable under pressure. And these are things I can help to manage. And when I think about my friend, as we're on the other hand, I'm aware that he might think I'm no longer, that I no longer value a friendship, but I can explain that, I think. And I can make it up to him. 
I think that friendship, generally, and our friendship in particular, is the kind of thing that's both, res both resilient and forgiving. And I think you'll understand. So you see there how I've gone through those reasons, and in a sense it's a response to the previous slide. And I've sort of said a bit more about my co-worker and this idea of vulnerability is an important concept. It's an important idea to think about how that plays, what that means in terms of our thinking about ethics. And importantly here I've talked about this idea of friendship and what's important there is it seems like that's a key element of this. Understanding what friendship is and what it means and how it plays out in a particular kind of case. So these are sort of a, sort of a set of values and commitments and understandings that we have and bring to the way in which we explain these things. So what I've done in those last two slides is tried in this example to give a set of reasons to sketch out a set of reasons that might justify my action. Now importantly, whether somebody agrees, and I am interested, I'm intrigued to, think what, to see what you think about my reasoning in that case, whether somebody does agree with my reasoning will depend on whether they accept my reasons and my justification. And that will depend in part on how they interpret the situation. And we saw earlier this idea about what my friend's friend might think and what another co-worker might think. But it will also depend on their counter-reasons, the reasons that they give, that they would give, or the way in which they would give their counter-reasons, and their criticisms of my reasons and the significance of them. So what I've given in the last two slides is the beginnings of an argument. An argument in favour of a particular course of action. Now, when you start thinking about your case and when you hear from other people in future weeks, you will hear arguments, and this is the sort of thing that's being constructed that we're trying to understand in this kind of case. <clears throat> so how does the reason giving work in this kind of situation? So the idea here is that the reasons justify my decision. They provide an argument for the decision that I've made. The standards of justification, that is, what counts as something being a good justification, it seems to me comes from the interaction. It comes from the activity of reasoning with other people. So I'm not there, as it were, thinking through my problem by myself with no standard. It's not just up to me what the standards of my reasons are. Right? There is some sense in which these are public. That idea of giving reasons of justifying my action seems necessarily to involve others and involve the standards, what others would say. So we're not aiming at something that's just good enough for us when we go through these reasons. When I, when I say in those previous slides, I say this is what I'm going to do, it's, a, it's making a claim on you. I'm saying, look, this is what I think is justified and your, your response matters, that, that process, those standards. So I'm aiming at a justification when we do this reasoning business. We're aiming at a justification that applies generally. Not just to those people, and, and, and only to, I mean, generally to people, not to, and those people who are interested in finding an answer. <clears throat> so, I've got four final points I just to sort of recap. But one of the things I just wanted to add, just perhaps on this last slide, is the way in which we're getting to these sort of, getting to this reason giving activity and how those standards. So, if we thought about this problem, the coffee problem, let's recall the coffee problem, um, and we came up with a course of action for me, in this case, and we gave, we spent the rest of, I'm sure this wouldn't go, spent the rest of the morning thinking about what would count as a justifiable action, this a good set of reasons. What we would be doing in that process is aiming to give an argument or give a set of reasons for a course of action that would make a claim on everybody outside. Right, so even here, even in this room, it wouldn't be, we wouldn't just be, we would be trying to agree, but we'd be trying to agree for everybody else. The idea would be that everybody else can sign up to these, this, this set of reasons as well. That's what we're aiming at. <clears throat> okay, four, four last points. Reasons and justification. The idea here is that the standards I've tried to suggest the standards here are public in some important sense. 
So reasons are the things that we try to get right when we're thinking about what we should do. And whether, we are, whether or not we are justified depends on whether or not we can give reasons and give an account that does make the appeal more generally. I talked about policy and law, the idea of deciding what the policy and law should be. <clears throat> These questions, the questions about deciding on what should the policy be, are importantly different um, from the specific ethical questions, eth ethics situations questions that, we've been, that, we've, that we also were looking at. The context is societal. The reasons are different. The reasons for adopting a piece of law or not, or a policy, are going to be different reasons, but they're going to function in the same way as the individual kinds of reasons. On disagreement, as we've seen, people will disagree. Even when they're genuinely trying to find an answer to an ethical problem. And I take that to be really important. I take it to be but the, the kind of disagreement that matters is disagreement between, between people who really want to find an answer. Not people who don't want to find an answer. We want people, th that's the kind of disagreement that matters here. And the best chance we have, I think, and this is a point about reason giving an argument, the best way of finding an answer or resolve, of finding a way forward in these kinds of cases is to give, is to give reasons and to continue, to continue to give reasons to each other in the hope that we can come to understand what those reasons are and what the arguments are and how they play out so that we can make a decision. Thank you. Dr. Sheehan, that was very thought provoking. Um, the paper, Dr. Sheehan's paper, will go up on the website, and I understand it's also, uh, we'll also put up the slides because I thought the slides really focused one's mind. They focused my mind as we were going through, so the, the slides will be on, on the website as well. Um, we're now going to go into a private session, um, and um, <coughs> Dr. Sheehan will, be, will still be here, and he, 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 he will can wander around and uh, deal with clarifying any issues that you don't quite understand. So when we talk about his clarification, and um, we will resume the public session at 10:45, um, and at that stage there will be a, a questions and answers session with Dr. Sheehan. Thank you very much. Thank you.